Welcome to Navigating Love and Immigration. I'm your host, Megan Pastrana. Falling in love is exciting. Maintaining a healthy relationship takes work. And when you're going through an immigration process, you are faced with unique challenges. This podcast is for anyone in a cross-cultural relationship who finds themselves lost in the labyrinth of U.S. immigration. We will interview relationship experts, explore the stories of real couples, and provide important tips on starting the next chapter of your lives together. Welcome to this week's episode of Navigating Love and Immigration. I'm your host, Megan Pastrana, and I'm really excited because today I have a very special guest with me, Dr. Gary Richter. He's a doctor of veterinary medicine, and in addition to owning a veterinary practice in California, he's also the author of the international bestseller, The Ultimate Pet Health Guide, and he also owns a company called um, Ultimate Pet Nutrition. And Dr. Richter He's won many national awards. I think it said over 30 national awards, and one of them is America's favorite veterinarian. And he has graced us with his presence, and he's here with us today to tell you all the important things you should know uh, about how to take care of your pets. And I know for all of the couples that we serve, part of that immigration process and starting that next chapter of your lives involves your furry family members who I know from having a pet, they really are. They're such an important part of our family. And so wanting to make sure they're supported during that transition is so important. So uh, Dr. Richter, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm, I'm so excited to have you. I am also excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I'd like to jump into your book. I think the way that you practice veterinary medicine, you really are revolutionizing uh, the that field, the veterinary medicine field, and how animals are cared for, balancing that, uh, the traditional medicine with a holistic approach. And that's really, your book really dives into that holistic attrition. So tell us more about what is the number one thing pet owners should know to give their animals, their pets, the best quality of life? That's a great question and a, and a pretty big one. Um, yeah. but, but, you know, I mean, you know, we can talk all day long about, about various, you know, various supplements, various, you know, testing procedures, what have you, that can be helpful for animals. But I think really, really where it all starts, the foundation for everything is nutrition. Uh, you know, I mean, we, we all know this from our own health, um, that, you know, that, you know, you have to eat right. Um, and we also all know from our own health that the more fresh whole foods we're eating, the more healthy we tend to be, you know, and the less processed food we're eating, the healthier we tend to be. Um, and I think that's probably the single biggest issue that I can see uh, with animal health is that most people are feeding their pets either, either dry food, kibble, or canned food, both of which by any definition of the word are highly processed foods. And they, they, you know, and they, they bring with them all of the baggage that highly processed food does for people. Uh, and, you know, I mean, as a pet owner, it's not your fault because this is what, you know, this is what the advertisements tell you. This is what the pet store tells you. And in most cases, this is what your veterinarian is telling you um, to feed your pet. Um, but again, you know, you don't need, you don't need a PhD in nutrition to understand that if you or your pet are eating highly processed foods all day, every day, then maybe that's not going to reflect well on long-term health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And for individuals who are in another country and are needing to relocate, you know, to the United States, I have a couple different questions, but I think the first one and something I always think about is related to nutrition if they're coming from another country and they might be feeding a certain brand of dog food and then they're bringing their pet here, what are things they can do to help with that, that transition? Sure. So, um, you know, when you're going to make a transition to a new food, it's always a good idea whenever possible to do that gradually. So, uh, you know, I mean, any kind of abrupt diet change uh, in an animal uh, is likely to lead to tummy upset, you know, potentially vomiting, diarrhea, that sort of thing. So, you know, I would say that if you're traveling, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're moving, 
uh, then if it is at all possible to travel with, you know, maybe a week's worth of food. Uh, so that way, when you get to your destination and you can get a new food, presumably a different brand, because maybe the brand that you're feeding is just not available here. Um, that way you have enough of the old food that you can do sort of a gradual transition over, you know, a few days or a week and allow their system to, uh, you know, to kind of adjust and reset. Because you know what? I mean, clearly traveling, moving, new environments, that in and of itself is a stress for pets. It's a stress for everybody. Sure. Um, so, you know, throwing that on top of an abrupt diet change to something brand new is really just, I mean, it's just asking for an upset tummy. So if it's possible to kind of mitigate that by by doing a gradual transition, I think that's ideally speaking the best way to go. Yeah, that's a, that's. I'm really glad you shared that information because I know a lot of the couples I've worked with, they'll tell me once they get here, you know, oh, in addition to being excited that they're starting their new lives, however, their pet is sick and and really struggling to make that transition. So that would be sure. something really helpful to for them to know. Um, and, and also with traveling, I know when I spoke with you last, we talked about how it's just not going to be a good day. You know, like you said, travel isn't fun for humans. I, none, I don't think any of us are like, yeah, I get to go to the airport today yeah, and right. I free know. transfers. And, yeah. and so is there anything for an, a pet who can't communicate, who is scared by new environments or maybe like just generally an ang have a lot of anxiety are there things that, that a, a pet owner can do to kind of mitigate some of that stress and anxiety? Yeah, uh, there definitely are things that you can do, um, you know, and, and certainly, you know, you have to think about, you know, what is the nature of the travel? Um, you know, if it is at all possible, try and mitigate, you know, sort of, you know, multiple stops along the way. I know that that's not always possible, but if you can do it with no stops or one stop rather than like three or four different flights, uh, you know, that would be that would be ideal. Getting your pet used to being in the carrier that they're going to be in, uh, all, you know, on the day of travel. Uh, you know, so what that means is, is for weeks, if not a month or more ahead of time, you want to start getting them used to being in that carrier. So, you know you know, feed them in the carrier, give them treats in the carrier, make it kind of a game. Once they get a little bit comfortable in the carrier, you put them in the carrier and put them in the car and just drive them around for a little while. Get them used to the concept of just the motion and moving around. So that way on the day of travel, at least they'll be reasonably comfortable in their immediate surroundings. Um, obviously, there's not much you can do about all of this sort of noise and whatnot that comes with airports and air travel and whatnot. But if they're comfortable where they are, that's helpful. Uh, another thing that I will suggest people do on the day of travel is put a put a bath towel that you've used in the carrier. So that way your smell is on it. So so that way they they have that connection to you as well. Uh, you know, depending on how long the flight is, there may be a consideration where, you know, you need to figure out how to get how to get water, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how to make sure that they get water. I mean, if it's a few hours, it doesn't matter. You know, if you're flying from, you know, from I don't know if you're flying from Indonesia to San Francisco, that's a long flight. Yeah. Um, and and, you know, I mean that, you know, then we'll have to figure out a way to make sure that they get enough enough water and whatnot. But really. It's a function of doing everything you can to make that day as easy as possible. Because as you say, I mean, travel days are not fun for anybody. No. Um, and particularly for an animal who does not cognitively understand what's going on. So anything that you can do to just sort of get them accustomed to the movement, the sounds, the, you know, whatever it may be, it's just going to take the edge off that much more. Um, the other nice thing to remember is, is that, you know, Animals very much live in the moment, which means once you get where you're going and you get settled and things quiet down, it might take them a day or two, um, but they'll get over it. Mm -hmm. They'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's a really good reminder about the having something that has your smell on it. Um, I mean, my, my dog, she's older and she's deaf now. And so it scares her, you know, when you're, when you, we leave the room. And so she's, she really clings to me and my, and my scent that, that really is even more important to her. And so I think that's interesting. You mentioned that because we have a, a travel blanket and I thought, I thought she just 
liked all of the blankets because they were fluffy. And then I realized, oh, no, I like the fluffy blankets. I'm always using those. That's why she's stealing them. But it provides yeah. her with so much comfort. Um, unfortunately, not not my husband. She doesn't care about the blankets that he uses. <laughs> but yeah, yeah and we have a blanket. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm her I'm her person. And so she'll she'll even pull it off the chair. And so we learned now with her anxiety and traveling that if we just I, I use my blanket here at my desk. And then um, when we travel, if we have to go in the car, we'll put that in there. And then she just snuggles in it and it just she feels close. So that's, that's a really perfect. good. Yeah, that's a really good pointer. And then that getting them used to their uh, their dog house, because uh, because I know some pets just feel like, oh, like I'm being punished. And so that's a, a really good. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, if they're not used to being in a carrier or in a crate, um, that can be really, really frightening mm -hmm. uh, and really stressful for them. So like I say, I mean, advanced planning is a, is a real big thing here because you can't just, can't just pop them in a carrier and call it good. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's like I say, it's a, it's a slow acclimation process. Yeah. Yeah. That's so bad. And that's something that with how long the immigration process takes, it's really important information that couples can really start working on that and getting yeah. their dog acclimated to. Yeah. Uh, the, so their, the good news uh, about that slow process is you have plenty of time to get your dog used to the crate. Yeah, you definitely, yeah, you definitely do. And the dog treats, those, those definitely work. She thinks that that was, she started thinking that was a trick. She'd get in her house and be like, okay, where's the yep. cookie? <laughs> so no, that's really, really helpful. And in terms of, um, actually bringing your pet. I know there's a lot of logistics in terms of vaccinations and things like that. So can you help um, individuals to know what are the steps they need to start working on to make sure they can actually be in compliance, their pet can be in compliance to enter the U.S.? Sure. Um, you know, depending on where you're coming from, you know, your, your, your veterinarian may or may not be able to give you some guidance in this regard. Um, but, you know, what people really need to do is they need to go online and look at the, the animal importation requirements into the United States. Uh, and that is gonna be completely variable depending on what country you're coming from. Um, uh, because the, the whole thing is really about, it's about disease transmission. So, so, you know, and this would be the case with any country that's taking in a new animal is they wanna make sure that that animal is not bringing in a foreign disease that doesn't already exist in that country. So for example, if somebody's coming into the United States from Canada or Mexico with which we obviously share a border, there's really not a lot of requirements there because you know whatever diseases exist in the US also exist in Canada and Mexico. Uh, you know, if if somebody's coming here from you know, from South America, from Africa, even potentially from from Australia, from Asia, that's a different story. Uh, and there are some tropical diseases that exist in those places that we don't see here in the U.S. So, so you know, United States Customs and the United States Department of Agriculture is going to want to make sure that that animal is free of those diseases. So, like I say, it depends on where you're coming from. So you need to you, you need to go on, on online and look up uh, what the requirements are. There is always going to be paperwork. There's going to be one or more health certificates that are required uh, that, generally speaking, have to be signed by a veterinarian, sometimes also have to be signed by a government official. Uh, so you really need to be very, very careful, uh, because as is always the case with government paperwork, if you show up in the United States and the paperwork's not right, there's going to be problems. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a, a pretty big parallel to the uh, the actual immigration case for the couple as well. I mean, there's a whole labyrinth of, of paperwork and things to be navigated and same for, for your pet. So you need to get a head start on that and probably be working on that simultaneously with your own um, immigration case. So when you say that um, a veterinarian has to, um, you know, review the vaccines, are you talking about a veterinarian in that country of origin or in the United States? Where should the person start? Yeah, in that country of origin. So whatever, whatever country they're leaving, that's the place to start. So for example, here in the US, like if I have, you know, if, if, if I have somebody that comes to me and says, I'm taking my dog to Australia, uh, you know, then, then, you know, the first step is for the pet owner and or somebody from my office, go online, find out what are the requirements to bring a dog into Australia. Uh, you know, we will go through whatever testing, whatever vaccines, whatever treatments need to be done, um, go through all of the paperwork. 
And then after we finish all of that paperwork, that paperwork then has to be reviewed by a government, a US government veterinarian to review the paperwork really for the purposes of making sure that everything is in order. Mm -hmm. uh, so that way, when that person gets to Australian customs in this example, that Australian customs is going to look at it and go, okay, this is all signed off. This is good. Everything's fine. Um, so there's kind of a, you know, there's sort of a checks and balances system there. Um, but that's really the way uh, one would want to get started. And, and, you know, I mean, if there are questions, then I would suggest that that person, again, you can go online or contact the U.S. Embassy. Uh, and, and, you know, and see if you can get some, some guidance from them on what is necessary to bring, you know, whatever animal you're bringing with you. And again, species of animal matters. Dogs and cats are one thing. If you're bringing birds, it's a very different thing from a disease transmission perspective. If you're bringing a horse with you again, it's a different thing. So you just, you just have to go through the process. Mm-hmm. And with, with an immigration process, it can sometimes take a year or more. So it sounds like a good piece of advice would be started at the same time you're starting your immigration case and then maybe closer, is there like a window of time closer to the travel that the person should be aware of to double check the compliance or change? Yeah, it? you know, that's a, that's a really great question because timing matters mm -hmm. for a lot of this stuff from the standpoint of when the animal was vaccinated, when were they dewormed, when were they treated for fleas and ticks, when were they tested for whatever disease needed to be tested for? So again, that's where you have to look on all of that compliance paperwork to figure out what your what your time windows are. Mm -hmm. And then classically, on top of all of that, as if that wasn't complicated enough, classically, the airlines will require um, a health certificate within 10 days of travel uh, just for a veterinarian to sign off and say that that animal is healthy enough to travel. Okay. All right. So that's a good, that's, yeah, that's a really important window of time. So probably at least, at least 30 days before when the couple knows that they have the visa and it's about time that they can at least give themselves some spaciousness to yeah. make sure they have their, their yeah, they need to plan it all out. And, and hopefully, you know, hopefully the, the, the person's veterinarian has some familiarity with doing this kind of stuff because it can like everything that has anything to do with, with governments, it can get complicated in the mm -hmm. paperwork. So working with somebody who's done this before can be a, a really, really big help. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that's definitely a really good uh, piece of advice to make sure that that person is, has, yeah, some kind of foundation or some kind of footing because you definitely don't want to come to the U.S. to find out you don't have the right things um, for your pet. But there's a, a kind of a rumor that I see all the time with couples talking about, oh, I, I heard I need to have a pet passport. And I know you said you know generally about pet passports, um, and I think you've really gone over the requirements, but can you please shed some light on whether or not it's true that you have to have that to get into the United States? I mean, I mean, that term pet passport, uh, you know, I think the term could be used in any number of ways. Um, you know, from the standpoint of like traveling to the United States, I mean, to me, a quote pet passport would really just mean that you have all of that paperwork in order that we just discussed. Now there are in certain circumstances, like legitimately something that would be called a pet passport. Usually that is more for the purposes of people that travel very frequently for their pets. A lot of times, like if they're traveling, uh, you know, like within the EU or they're going back and forth to the UK. So that way it's, it's, it's one central place where that person has all of that pets vaccine history, their health certificates, their paperwork, what have you. Um, but, but what I would suggest is don't get hung up on that term. The term doesn't really mean much. All you need to do is, as, as we were discussing, is just find out what documentation you need to get from wherever you are into the U.S., and that is, that is all you need to worry about. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure compliance with vaccinations. And one of the really important things that I, I'm hoping everyone is getting from this is that you really, really need to make sure you involve a veterinarian in this process and not try to, to DIY this because it breaks my heart when I see people trying to get records and thinking they can, can DIY it. You really need to get an expert involved to make yeah, sure. And you know what? You cannot DIY it because at some point a veterinarian signature is going to be required. Yep. Yeah. Um, so you can DIY some of it from the standpoint of gathering all of the paperwork, mm -hmm. but eventually you are going to have to get a veterinarian involved 
to, to, to finish this process. Yeah, definitely. And also, like you said, getting started sooner rather than later, making sure that I think that's the biggest, that's the biggest takeaway, get a veterinarian involved sooner rather than later. No, that, um, that's very yeah. true. Because like, in certain circumstances, um, you know, like, for example, just to use the the, the Australia example, again, um, there are so many requirements to get an animal into Australia that you literally need a, probably a minimum of 60 days to wow. get everything in order because of the testing that's involved and the schedule and the timing of the treatments and the vaccines. So like if somebody were to call my office today and say, Hey, I'm taking my dog to Australia in three weeks. What do I need to do? My comment to them would be, you need to change your travel plans <laughs> because you're not doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And I can assure you that, that, you know, be it the Australian government or any other government, they do not look kindly upon people showing up without all of that paperwork in order. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure they, I'm sure they don't. And it makes, I know it, it makes sense. And I know some individuals, I know it's a frustrating process, but it's really comparable to what you they do for an individual who wants to immigrate to the United States. It's just making sure communicable diseases, just making sure everybody's safe, uh, pets and people included. So yeah, very um, true. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time here today. This was just such such helpful information. I know that a lot of the couples who are starting out on their immigration journey are in the middle of their immigration journey. This is going to be such valuable information uh, for them. Um, is there anything else, any other tips or anything else that you would like to, to share? You know, I mean, I think as it pertains to the whole travel discussion, uh, you know, we've already said this a lot, but plan ahead. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the biggest thing, both from the standpoint of, um, you know, of the paperwork of the regulations, but also from the perspective of getting your pet, you know, accustomed to travel. Um, and then, uh, you know, I mean, and then once you get to wherever you're going, as soon as it is reasonably possible, try and establish sort of a, you know, a, a, a stable environment uh, for your pet. Um, because after all of that moving around, the thing that they really want is, you know, they want, they want some quiet time, you know, they want to not have, you know, more, more strange things happen to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, so, and, and just be patient. Uh, you know, like I say, I mean, these guys, they will adjust, uh, frequently they will adjust better than we do. Um, you know, and, and realize that, I mean, like, you know, we're, we're there for each other from the standpoint of us, uh, you know, us and our pets. We support them. They support us. It's unconditional love. Uh, you know, it's 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 the best thing ever. It is the best thing ever. I uh, we love our dog. I mean, it really is. It's such a it's such a great connection and wanting to support. Yeah, your pets on this this journey too. So, thank you again. Um, I, I'm so grateful for your time. I know all of our couples will be extremely grateful. And we will put links um, for all of those of you who are watching on the YouTube channel or, or on, you know, Apple or wherever you happen to listen to your podcast in the show notes. We'll put a link to um, Dr. Richter's book, The Ultimate Pet Health Guide. Um, you have a, a fabulous YouTube channel. Um, I'm going to put a link to that as well. If you're wanting to get really great tips on nutrition and, and anything you need to know about your pet or just to learn more, we'll put all of the links to, to Dr. Richter's websites and uh, resources below. So Thank you again, and thank you all for watching. Thanks so much.